Hello, I'm Dr. Sheila N. Mugge, and I am the Director of the Division of Pediatric Endocrinology and Diabetes at Johns Hopkins. Today I'm going to be presenting a case of type 2 diabetes during childhood. JC is a 13-year-old African-American female who presents to her pediatrician with increased fatigue and vaginal itching. During the history, she states that she has irregular menses, which are heavy and often painful. Her mother is concerned because she wet the bed twice in the last week, which is new. JC has always, quote, drunk a lot, and she is, denies polyuria. On dietary history, she says that she often skips breakfast, and she drinks five to six glasses of juice or soda every day. When asked about physical activity, she participates in school gym three times per week, but she has no other regular exercise. She spends about four hours per day on TV and video games. On family history, it's noted that her father has type 2 diabetes. There's a history of obesity and cardiovascular disease in the paternal grandparents. Physical exam is noted for a blood pressure of 133 over 75. Her BMI is 42 kilograms per meter squared. She has acne on her skin, on her face and upper back. She has darkened skin on her neck and she has slight hirsutism on her face. She has erythema of the labia with whitish discharge on GU exam. So we ordered labs and what we ordered were fasting glucose hemoglobin A1C, a comprehensive metabolic panel, fasting lipids, and a urinalysis. We also plan to do a PCOS evaluation given her history of irregular periods, acne, and some hair growth. So here are the results of some of our labs. The urinalysis showed moderate glucose with no ketones. The hemoglobin A1C was 6.8% and the glucose on the comprehensive metabolic panel was 208 milligrams per de deciliter. Can you make a diagnosis? So in order to answer this question, I want to step back a little bit and talk about type 2 diabetes during childhood. So first, risk factors. Race and ethnicity is a risk factor in that prevalence of type 2 diabetes is increased in immigrant and minority populations. African Americans, Hispanic and Latino children, and Asian Americans, as well as Native Americans, are all at increased risk. Type 2 diabetes also disproportionately affects those of lower socioeconomic background. Another risk factor is obesity, particularly visceral adiposity or the fat surrounding your organs and your waist circumference is a surrogate measure of this. And then another risk factor is decreased exercise or increased sedentary activity. In terms of family history, 74 to 100 percent of type 2 diabetic children have a first or second degree relative with type 2 diabetes. And finally, if somebody is going to develop type 2 diabetes, it often happens during puberty, which is a period of relatively increased risk because during puberty, you have the secretion of growth hormone, which is thought to increase insulin resistance. In presentation, common symptoms are polyuria, polydipsia, nocturia, yeast infections, new onset enuresis, and sometimes children with type 2 diabetes can be asymptomatic as well. On physical exam, common findings are obesity and signs of insulin resistance such as acanthosis nigricans. In more extreme cases than ours, um, you can also see de dehydration. So this table is taken from the American Diabetes Association Standards of Care in Diabetes. And what you can see here are the criteria for diagnosis of type 2 diabetes in children. And the criteria include a fasting plasma glucose of greater than or equal to 126 milligrams per deciliter, a two-hour glucose on an oral glucose tolerance test of 200 or higher milligrams per deciliter, a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5% or higher, or a random blood sugar of 200 milligrams per deciliter per deciliter or greater, along with classic symptoms of uh, diabetes or hyperglycemia, I should say. Any of these would be enough for the diagnosis of diabetes. So here in our case, we have both a hemoglobin A1C 
of 6.8%, so that fits the criteria for hemoglobin A1C, and we actually have another finding with a glucose on the comprehensive metabolic panel of 208. She does drink a lot as well, and she has recently wet the bed, so, which is evidence of nocturia. So I think that all these things allow us to make the diagnosis of diabetes. So in this case, she was referred for an appointment to Johns Hopkins Pediatric Diabetes Center. And at diagnosis, the family met with our diabetes educator, pediatric endocrinologist or the nurse practitioner, nutritionist, behavioral health team, and all of these people stress the importance of lifestyle modification through diet and exercise. The type two education is for the entire family, and including glucometer teaching that for anyone that might be helping with glucometer checks in order to keep track of the child's blood sugar. At baseline, we check a hemoglobin A1C, comprehensive metabolic panel to check liver function tests and screen for fatty liver disease. We do a urinalysis with a microalbumin to creatinine ratio and a diabetes autoimmune panel to rule out type one diabetes. We also check a fasting insulin if the child has not been started on insulin yet and see peptide and a fasting lipid panel. Treatment is really aimed at normalizing blood glucose and is multifold. We are more aggressive in children in terms of type two diabetes compared to adults because we know that children have their whole life in front of them and we want that to be long and healthy. Our treatment options include lifestyle modification through diet and exercise for everyone, and then metformin as well as insulin treatment. Starting with metformin, metformin is the only oral drug approved by the FDA for treatment of type two diabetes in children. It improves insulin sensitivity. It decreases hepatic gluconeogenesis. Now there are side effects. The common ones of these are gastrointestinal, nausea, bloating, diarrhea, abdominal cramps. Now all of these should go away as a if the child persists in taking the medicine. There are more rare side effects such as lactic acidosis and me megaloblastic anemia. And we also recommend that children stop taking the metformin 48 hours before or, and after surgery or if they're going for a radiology procedure um, with which they will have contrast. Now for metformin initiation, we check at, at baseline CBC, transaminases, and kidney function, and these are also followed while on treatment. So in order to try to avoid those common side effects, I increase the dose gradually by 500 milligram increments every week to a maximum of 1,000 milligrams twice per day with meals. And this shows a sample regimen where we start with 500 milligrams after dinner for one week and then gradually increase that up by 500 milligrams at each, dose, each week to come to the final dose of 1,000 milligrams in the morning and 1,000 milligrams at night after meals. So for type two diabetes, lifestyle modification is crucial. It's multidisciplinary and we try to achieve um, seven to 10% decrease in excess weight. And we know that a relatively small weight loss like 7% can reverse prediabetes during childhood. And this we know from the diabetes prevention program. So we recommend increased physical exercise the ADA recommends 60 minutes per day of moderate to vigorous physical activity and strength training on at least three days per week. So when we talk about moderate and vigorous physical activity, I tell families that what that means is the child should be out of breath, heart beating faster, and they're working hard a bit to breathe. Now nothing should be hurt, hurting, and they should stop if that happens. If there's wheezing or anything like that, like asthma symptoms, they should stop. We also try to decrease sedentary activity and recommend limiting screen time to no more than two hours per day. In terms of dietary modification, the family meets with a nutritionist, but even on our own, we can eliminate sugar containing drinks. We can recommend that they don't skip meals, no frequent snacking, work on portion sizes, low fat foods, having at least five servings of fruits and vegetables a day, increasing whole grains and fiber. These are all good and relatively low hanging fruit that we can work on with the family. 
We follow patients and their families every three months with the whole team and they see typically the provider, nurse educator, nutritionist, and if um, recommended a behavioral health specialist. We follow the A1C and blood glucose levels over, the time, over time, and our general target is a hemoglobin A1C less than 7% for type 2 diabetes. We also screen yearly for complications, including nephropathy, neuropathy, retinopathy, cardiovascular disease in terms of dyslipidemia and hypertension, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We also screen and refer for treatment of comorbidities. So mental health, depression and anxiety, obstructive sleep apnea, we ask about symptoms of snoring or pauses when breathing, polycystic ovarian syndrome, we ask questions about regularity of periods in girls, hypertension, fatty liver disease, and dyslipidemia. So this was an example of a case of a patient, a child with type 2 diabetes. If you'd like to refer one of your patients to our outpatient diabetes center, the number is on the screen. Thank you very much.